Hello, welcome to the iCast. We talk about everything comic book. Joining me tonight is John. Hello. Alex. Yo. And Jim. Hello, everyone. And I'm Mike. Uh, tonight we're going to be, we, we were sort of talking the other day about our favorite rogues galleries and how every time we talked about rogues gallery uh, rogues, I guess, um, we seem to come upon the, the same three people. It's either Batman, The Flash, or Spider-Man. Uh, because they sort of all three have these very this very rich rogues gallery so it made us think about uh, talking about some of our favorite rogues galleries that aren't included in either of those three uh, we don't really have a set number here we're just going to talk about a few of them um so uh let's not stand on ceremony john what's the first one you'd like to talk about uh i'm gonna go right off with my background here tonight uh fantastic four um what a, now, when we were first thinking about this, I wanted to mention, I wasn't sure if we were going to include teams, if we were going to include individuals. So I kind of had them as one of my backups as well. So I said either Reed Richards or the Fantastic Four. It kind of works either way. Um, yeah, that is, that is I, and I didn't, I guess I didn't think about that um, or think of it that way, but but you're <laughs> right. It, it does kind of come down to him because again, um, uh, the Human Torch kind of has his own rogues from uh, uh, the individual series that he had in the past and as well as uh the thing with uh marvel two and one um fought a lot of villains and and repeat villains uh so i went with uh, unfortunately his invisible woman doesn't really have any on her own which is probably emblematic of the time yes maybe she should though i, I would think now that she would qualify now that it, you find out that she has wasn't she a former shield agent or something like that i, th I think that's what they wasn't everybody <laughs> yes well um i went with the fantastic four um and uh i found a really good site that that listed all of their villains um so i went through and just kind of identified uh really key ones uh with the fantastic four and um again the it's very it's a varied uh, list of of villains um, or forces of nature, uh, but to start with, I had uh, Mole Man, the Skrulls, and the Super Skrull, um, Namor, uh, who's always been an off and on uh, ally or villain, Doctor Doom, of course, Puppet Master, Impossible Man, the Red Ghost, Mad Thinker. Ramatut, Molecule Man, Hate Monger, Diablo, Ronin, uh, Dragon Man, Claw, Blastar, and Annihilus. That's that's just uh, some of the most classics. Um, you haven't even made it past issue one hundred. That that is that is true. And then there's one thing I was going to mention. There's a couple there's a couple of villains there, and we, and we kind of talked before we got started recording. There are multiple villains that sort of change their who their their primary uh, antagonist or, or protagonist is over the years. And there's a couple of those characters that I kind of would put under a different character slash characters. Um, but uh, but yeah, and Ramatut. I feel like Ramatut. It always has an asterisk next next to him. Because yes, he did appear in the Fantastic Four first, but I mean, I think ultimately that's Kang and that's an Avengers villain. I think. Yes. And, and and you could probably say the same thing with Daredevil, for example, with um, uh, Kingpin. You know, again, he started out as uh, and Electro and Mysterio, uh, a, a major villain for uh, Spider-Man, and he, he works just as good, or if not better. Uh, so what do you think are the say you were to give like two or three of those villains that are sort of the most defined by the way did you mention galactus because i feel like yeah. i should mention galactus yes okay, um good. i said uh I referred to him as the a force of nature more than more than a villain um tell that to the planets he ate That's um what are uh, maybe two or three of the villains that you think kind of define the fantastic four i think with the fantastic four it's kind of easy i think there's like one that's like kind of I, over the top and um, Annihilus is a is a really good one because of uh, just the the nature of how he came about. With they were trying to find a defense against uh, Galactus, and um, one of the things that Reed Richards tried to do is uh, kind of save the Earth or patrol the Earth from hyperspace, and because of that, he found the negative zone, and 
the negative zone spelled out all sorts of different villains, you know, just besides Annihilus. But uh, he was basically the ruler of this whole antimatter universe. Um, and, and again, uh, he's got the equivalent of the power, the power cosmic with his, uh, uh, with his, yes, with his cosmic rod. Um, a, another one that, that really falls under, under that too, um, even though uh, he's earthbound is uh, the puppet master. Um, and he's almost a precursor to uh, the purple man in, in the things that he can do. Um, but again, he just has this monomania for his adopted daughter and, and that, but, uh, he's been the bane of the Fantastic Four's existence since issue seven. Especially to Ben Grimm, since he's had, since he's fallen in love with his, uh, goddaughter or whatever, like his stepdaughter, like, the basically yep. his daughter, you know, it's like, that's always been a bane of his existence. Um, you know, and then, uh, Dr. Doom, of course, but, um, uh, the Red Ghost is is sometimes forgotten, but um, basically he was the the Russian equivalent of the Fantastic Four for the longest time. Um, the super apes. And uh, then they added this other dimension to them is, is that uh, they would swap powers or intellects because uh, they were like fusing into one. Um, and, and again there's usually a lot of machinations, uh, with, with him. So he would almost be an equivalent to, um, the mad thinker. Um, but, but again, that would be uh, a key one. And of course, uh, Galactus and everything that's, that spawned from that. And that's everything from, uh, uh, the, not uni mind, uh, the overmind, um, uh, Roger. Uh, into the watcher the silver surfer well um i was just thinking villain wise but um uh the stranger um uh again and the varied um heralds that were that they had to deal with um terax whatever it is yeah terax a terrible um fire lord yes and um i had yeah that uh and I, and I cannot remember the other one. Um, the squirrel girl. Nova that had nothing to do with uh, Nova Core. Yes. Uh, and so um, everything cosmic kind of falls under that category. And uh, so that's one of the things that, that's always made the, the his their rogues gallery is just the threat level. Um, and almost all of them could easily translate into uh, an Avengers villain. Uh, you know, some of them have, you know, such as Doom. Um, and some of them, yeah, like not just the Avengers, the entire Marvel Universe, like the Galactus and the Scrolls, like the Secret Invasion, and the Kree became like a center focus of the universe, like the whole Kree Skull War, the Space Phantoms, uh, just everything about everything that the Fantex Four was built on helped build the foundation of the Marvel Universe. And at some point, every Marvel character has had an interaction with one of their villains or characters at some point well to be uh, fair the thing with the fantastic four that makes them kind of it's almost kind of a cheat because they're the first like they're yeah. literally the first marvel comic uh, yeah. so their first comes out in 1961 and fantastic or in avengers number one and x-men number one come, don't come out until i think 62 right right early to mid 62 um so you know for a good solid what six seven months at least you have the fantastic four they basically have the field i mean it's just you know you know jack and stan kind of doing whatever they want um uh, well, that's a, Alex, what what do you talk about? Some of the villains. Is there any villains that John hasn't talked about that you think sort of uh, uh, are sort of define the Fantastic Four or are important to the Fantastic Four story? Uh, yeah. So some that he didn't uh, touch on that um, I think two big ones are the Super Scroll and Ronan the Accuser because those laid the foundations to some of uh, other like various characters within the Marvel and help like define the greater galactic um, background and like character building of the Marvel universe what with the old Kree Skull War and then you have the Inhumans and then you have all these characters who were scrolls who like one was a Johnny Storm love interest one grew up to become Hulkling one was part of the uh, Runaways uh, pretty much 
And then, and that's, and then there's like the whole Captain Marvel. I, I refuse to call him Captain Marvel. Uh, Marvel thing, uh, thing. And but I think another one I really wanted to find the that I think defines the Fantastic Four that I feel gets not a lot of rep is um, the one who's the ruler of the microverse, um, who has that special. Oh, uh, Psycho Man. Yeah, Psycho Man, because he. Uh, everyone thought Susan Storm was dead for a while, but he actually managed to turn her into his evil slave. And he's got that thing that can mess with your emotions. That's his greatest weapon. And you've seen the kind of damage he's done with it. That's an underrated uh, Marvel uh, Fantastic Four villain, in my opinion, because it deals with a place that the Fantastic Four would eventually go on to be, and that's the microverse. But you don't see him as much as the others. And I feel like he's an underrated one that really stands out. And because what I love about the Fantastic Four is that. I mean, the team, I've always, I've always dealt, I've always looked at the Fantastic Four as, as explorers and scientists first and then superheroes because everything that they come in contact with, they either discovered accidentally while doing an experiment or searching the greater universe of something. And they ended up saving the world in the process based on what kind of like what, what Reed Richards was studying at the time. So a lot of ways they created their own villains, but in a lot of ways they created their own adventures and you look at any one of the super, any of one of the Fantastic Four villains. They're either they're a mad scientist or a space demon or like some sort of magic twisted. It's like anything you could find in a science fiction book, you can find in the Fantastic Four's Rose Gallery. Uh, Jim, any other uh, Fanta- FF villains that they haven't talked about or something you'd like to add to that? Um, I'd just like to say, uh, for me, Namor has always been. Uh, one of the most fan, important Fantastic Four villains. Uh, mostly because- By the way, uh, it, we, we should actually the, break here. Just real quickly, what do you guys think of the casting? I, I like the casting. Honestly, the only thing that bothers me about uh, Namor is I don't believe you should have facial hair. It's this. It's the smallest weird thing. But in my mind, Namor should be clean shaven. Other than that, I, I think it's it's fine casting. I didn't notice the facial hair. I, I, I just saw the preview. But anyway. I haven't seen the preview yet. And I'm hesitant well, to you don't get a ton of it, but I'm I'm definitely <laughs> anyway. Sorry, you can so you have anymore. like a, a mustache or what? I don't. Know, it seemed like it was like kind of maybe like a mustache, or I don't remember now. Well, I, I, in, one of the, it, I in one of the stills that I saw, he had a jade um, nose ring. Nose ring. Well, yeah, it wasn't even a ring. It was uh, like a barb. Oh, it was a piercing. I think it yeah. seems like he had a beard and like a like a maybe like a goatee or something in one shot. But I, I if if he doesn't, I stand corrected. Um, so with Namor, I feel like uh, kind of creepier aspect, but uh, pretty important in the earlier comics is that he's in love with Sue Storm. And um, not only is he mad at the uh, surface dwellers all the time, but Sue is with the wrong man and she needs to be with him. So I just think that's an interesting dynamic between him and uh, Sue and Reed. Um, there, I and I don't remember. It was middle seventies. Uh, Sue and Reed separated, and do you know where she went? Tony Stark's. <laughs> she went to Atlantis. Very interesting. the The other thing I was going to say about the Fantastic Four is, uh, I've really enjoyed the Guardians of the Galaxy unexpectedly in the marvel universe but i feel like they just kind of blew right into the wider universe and it's kind of stolen the thunder of the fantastic four being the night that kind of 1960s we're going to be the first to explore space feel like that's done in the marvel universe um, although you never I'm know sure we'll still know. be explorers but it won't be into the complete unknown but we don't know when the fantastic four are going to end they could introduce the fantastic four as having always existed in the mcu and they've already been exploring space for 25 years you know by the time we meet them so it's so possible uh, although i will say that something that i find kind of interesting as somebody that didn't get into reading the fantastic four well still really hasn't really gotten into reading the fantastic four a lot a lot of my introductions to the characters you guys are talking about, whether it's Annihilus or the Super Scroll uh, or a lot of these other people, my introduction was the Guardians of the Galaxy in the comics during uh, Annihilation Wave 
and uh, uh, what was the sequel? Uh, Annihilation Conquest, the one with where uh, Ultron is leading the uh, what's that? The alien race that's all cybernetic or whatever. Oh, the, uh, 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 um, uh, that, that... of course, I can't think of it right now. I'll think of it at some point. Anyway. Um, so, well, you you find that to be kind of off-putting because that's how you my introduction that sort of goes with my introduction to the characters. Um, the one, the only characters I'd like to mention that haven't been mentioned before, and one of them I'm kind of surprised was started off in the Fantastic Four because I associated him with being an Avengers villain. That's Atuma, uh, who actually fits in pretty well with uh, Namor because they, you know, he's like Namor but with gills, and uh, uh, he pops up a ton in the Avengers. Uh, the other, uh, the Frightful Four, for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. um and the other one that again a, a group that i didn't get into a bunch and is sort of have sort of grown to appreciate later on life which is the inhumans and the specific vill villain being maximus um and i think he's kind of a the, the inhumans always are always popping up kind of all, always popping up all over marvel but i think primarily they they stay fantastic for even though they you know they pop up in the avengers and i think maybe a little bit in the x-men too um and that's that's only been recently uh, within probably the past 10 years they didn't pop up in Avengers fairly early on. They were in yes. Avengers when, within the first, you know, five, ten years. Um, but yeah, he's an interesting villain, too. Oh, and Claw. Claw's another one we didn't talk about. I think Claw's a really interesting villain. It's funny that you guys bring this up because, you know, as the, the, event, the Fantastic Four not only paved the way for a lot of the galactic or more galactic world building of the Marvel Universe, but they also introduced some of their greatest superheroes, too. They you, We got Namor back. We got uh, Black Panther, we got the Inhumans, we got Silver Surfer, and all these guys started Willy out. Willie Lumpkin. <laughs> yes. All these guys. The greatest superheroes. And all these guys actually started out as foes to the Fantastic Four, even though they were just like one shot, but they ended up becoming heroes in their own right. And a lot of what they became, a lot of what their own rogues galleries came because of the Fantastic Four, too. And I would just like to note that all the, I think most of those people that you mentioned, appeared in like i don't know 15 issue span john i yes. mean what what a tremendous uh, span of comics that was from like the mid 40s to mid 50s because like i think it was issue 23 is where uh the 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 frightful four appeared um and uh, again but even if you're just talking in humans silver surfer black panther like yeah because it, that's that's the way it kicked off is is that the introduction of uh, Black Panther, and then that there was uh, there was like three or four issues there. Then it was they get back, and then it was Johnny falls in love with uh, Crystal. <clears throat> and it was the Inhumans, and then from the Inhumans it was Galactus and, and Silver Surfer, and it just uh, again it just makes you wonder. Um, how how they did that you know because it it's like manic frenzy you know uh music i i, I guess it's just it just flowed well, from them i i read you know the first issue of fantastic four you know quite a while ago and it's interesting because if you were going to write that same issue today that would be six issues at least you know that that one comic would have to be six issues because they just couldn't cover that much in one issue well if you um, remember there's three chapters in that uh in that first issue is there's it's been a long time like it's been shopping for clothes and well they, first of all they go to space and come back and that's like six pages or something like that like them getting their superpowers realizing the superpowers is like the first five or six pages of the book and and then the next set is you know mole man attacks and then they have to go find him and then uh then chapter three is is them getting them finally defeating him and saving the world. The one thing that I ran across while reading the Avengers of that same period is the Avengers cross over with X-Men a little bit, but they cross over with Fantastic Four very, very little. So it almost seems like the Fantastic Four and also the Avengers crosses over with the other books, you know, because obviously, you know, Tony, uh, the Iron Man book and the Ant-Man book and all these other things are sort of crossing over with Avengers pretty regularly, whereas Fantastic Four kind of seems like during that period, it's kind of just on its own. And they're kind of doing their own things. And the characters will cross over, or the, the villains will sometimes cross over into the Avengers, the X-Men or something like that. But the Fantastic Four seemed like during that period, it was the most standalone of, of, of those books. Um, there, there were some guest appearances by, I can only think of one of the Avengers. And that was, 
um, so, that something. Works with the Hulk? Um, big, uh, big uh, like around yeah. issue twenty nine or something. The yeah, but the Hulk probably wouldn't have been in the Avengers at that point. No, I th- I I thought the Fantastic Four and the Avengers were fighting the Hulk together. Uh, they were at a construction site that that's on the cover. That that's what I remember. Mm-hmm. Right I wouldn't swear to, I just I don't remember seeing any of the Fantastic Four in. I mean, obviously, you know, Black Panther crosses over and he he joins the Avengers, you know, for a long time. Um, and then Spider Man pops up. Spider Man pops up everywhere, and Doom, Doctor Doom, pops up everywhere here and there. But mm-hmm. it just it seemed to me like kind of a stand book. One other uh, villain, uh, and this obviously much later on from Hickman's run, but is the evil Reed Richards uh, from the the other universe. Hey, Stram- I think he's really, yeah, what's his name? Uh, what's his name? The, it's not the yeah. maestro because that's the evil hulk right I, it's like the the thinker man. no 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 it's uh <laughs> now that i said the maestro i can't get half of this half of this episode is just going to be us like do you remember that guy what was his At name that place with the thing i'll oh, look yeah. it up we'll, we'll have it here um maker the maker yeah. yes maker yeah here you go He's wearing um, his mom's popcorn popper on his head. I'm betting that he's going to show up, by the way, since we have uh, parallel universes, multiverse. Yeah, oh, man. Speaking of that, like in the MCU, I've, I watched, so I watched uh, Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness and Thor Love and Thunder, and uh, I've not been uh, overly satisfied, to be honest. Yeah. It's been... Uh, they were better. It was, they were better. Well... Doctor Strange was better than the Eternals. I don't know. Thor was a hot mess. I mean, there were parts so, that were okay, and I laughed. briefly on the Eternals. And we're getting off topic, but it's fine because we can get off topic. We're adults; we can talk about whatever we want. <laughs> um, I feel like the Eternals at least felt different than the other Marvel movies. It yes. wasn't good, but I feel like they had. Uh, uh, oh God, the director uh, Chloe Zhao, um, <clears throat> who had done uh, um, uh, won an Oscar the previous year, and I feel like she was doing something different. Um, what she was doing different, I don't think it really worked necessarily, but I feel like there has been such a sameness to the Marvel movies for the past really few years. Yes. Um, that it's just, I don't know. I mean, the whole joke every, every, you know, 25 seconds and it's just, you know, it's, it's very, I mean, so I watched uh, uh, the, the latest Spider-Man movie, uh, which is, which I liked a lot. Um, and the, the movie is allowed to have some melancholy to it and is allowed to have feelings. Whereas again, if you haven't seen Thor, I'm not going to spoil anything about it. Um, but that movie does not give you five seconds to feel any emotions at any given time. It is just constantly, no, move on to the next thing, on to the next <clears> thing. <throat> it's very distracting. And I feel like- Well, it was satisfying. originally supposed to be like a Snyder cut thing. It was going to be like four hours. That's what the director said. Well, Maybe I, so they I, out I all have a great- parts. Because it seemed like there were three, like three movie plots shoved together that's that was that was my feeling of it yeah it was basically at least uh, at least three yes (laughs) it was basically the batman versus superman of the marvel universe i just i feel like i have a great degree of of appreciation for taika waititi and some of the stuff he's done in a lot of his other movies um but i don't i I have not liked his marvel stuff anyway um let's move on uh alex uh what is the first rogues gallery you'd like to talk about well uh well, the one I'm actually going to, since we're talking X-Men, I'm going to say my favorite uh, gallery out of, well, I'm not sure if it's my favorite, but I think it's the one that's a best example of the of Greater Rogues Gallery outside of Flash, Batman, and uh, Spider-Man is the X-Men. Now, what I love about the X-Men, and I've said this, for the longest time, X-Men have just, like, it's been growing to a point where the X-Men could be their own thing. Like, if Marvel, like, fell apart and someone bought all the x-men rights they could just create one single universe focused solely on the avengers of the x-men and it would be like its own thing from everything that's how it did with the fox stuff but the x-men have just got grown to a point where like they have like all these characters and not to mention all these villains and really they have like probably the most for a team of superheroes they probably have a more extensive rogues gallery than like the Justice League or the Avengers do, and they're right up there with the Fantastic Fours. Then you got classics like Magneto, Apocalypse, um, the Brotherhood of Evil Mutants. Uh, you got 
Professor Xavier's like surrogate twin, uh, the Shadow King, Mojo, Mr. Sinister, uh, the Phoenix Force, uh, and then all the members like Sabretooth, Mystique, the Sentinels, Bolivar Trask, Bastion, the Nimrod. Um, you, you can go on for hours, like naming all these vi villains, and you could get away with doing that because so a lot of these people who are fans of the X-Men are able to name as many rose galleries of the X-Men as they are with the Batman or Super with like Batman or Flash or Spider-Man. And you know, the fact that this is a team of heroes who has all these villains that kind of intertwine with their their stories is just unbelievable. That just showcases how big the X-Men have gotten over the years. And it's not by the way, Alex, I would like to say when you said they could do the X-Men totally separately, they did. It's called the Fox Universe. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. They literally did that. I'm just saying if they did a comic book thing just away from the rest of the Marvel Universe, they could get away with that. Anyway. I, I think that that actually brings up kind of an interesting question <clears throat> because I think you're 100% right. And I think that the X-Men is like, it's huge. It's sprawling. I mean, the, the, the X-Men, like, even if, before you even get into the villains, just look at the actual people that have joined, that have been in the X-Men. I mean, that's more than the members of like the Thunderbolts, the Avengers and the Fantastic Four all put together. Uh, and it's not even close. I mean, the, the not members of the of the the uh, X Men has just been huge. And then you get into the villains. And then it's the villains, you know, the individual X Men's villains and the team's villains. Um, and by the way, every time somebody says Mojo, I just think of the Powerpuff Girls and want to call them Mojo Jojo. <laughs> and that's that's I think the crossover we really need uh, in comic books. And it's and it's not just and a lot of these like you said, a lot of these villains intertwine with the single heroes. I mean. Probably like half of the X Men's villains actually are just Wolverine villains alone, but that's because Wolverine is everywhere. Um, and for better or worse, yep. And then like you have villains who started out at who like were belonged to the X Men, but went to their sub teams like New Mutants, X Force, um, X Factor, X Static, um, Young Young X Men, Generation Next, or uh, the Marauders. Marauders, and then you have like villains who came in from those team <clears throat> books, and they fought the original X Men, and like it's just amazing. Like, and they and they're, the X Men's like their whole system of rogues gallery is based on the hatred of mutants from one way or another, or the or the empowerment of mutants. Like, you have obvious like Magneto or Trask and the Sentinels, and then you have. Um, apocalypse who's like his own like destroy all mutants and humans and let the strongest live and then you have like mojo who just wants to uh promote the x-men as part of his like entertainment system he wants he sees them as circus freaks to, for his own amusement and then you have um it's just like the x-men it's it's, it's, a, it's so extensive but it all comes down down back down to oppression and rights because that's what the immunes are they fight for their rights and they fight to protect themselves from oppression so it's like and it's, it's all about being different and so mojo is basically just rupert murdoch um with I, more arms okay alex first of all before we go on uh, why don't you uh give us like i don't know two or three that you think are the most defining uh uh villains of the x-men the ones that really sort of define them as a team okay well off the back my first one is definitely going to be magneto uh, the first and original, um, because not only is he able to, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe -toe with all the X-Men, that's how powerful he is, but he's also everything that the X-Men are against. Like, he is about oppressing humans, like, because he thinks they're going to oppress the mutants, just like the Nazis oppressed the Jewish people, and he went through that during the Holocaust, so he's seen it firsthand. So in a lot of ways, you see that he's right. He knows first experience. So... So not only is he like opposite of what the X-Men stand for, but he's one of the opposites that are like, okay, I can see where you're going with this. And that's why a lot of mutants side with him because they understand how he's feeling. And I think enough off the back that I'm going to say is another obvious one is going to be uh, Apocalypse because I consider him the dark side of the X-Men's universe. Like even like from a Marvel viewpoint, Apocalypse is like the dark side of the Marvel universe. Um, He's all powerful. He's got. He's he's all about the strong ruling over the weak. He's got so. He's got so many. He's got a kick-ass design that's like 
uh, stood the test of time. He's got a connection to religion with like the four horsemen and like basically everything that X-Men worry about happening, he chuck, he creates a lot of the timelines that the X-Men are trying to stop. Um, like, like Cable's timeline or any other branch of that. A lot of the future timelines that Marvel has stems from Apocalypse himself. They're trying to prevent that future from coming. And I guess if I had to choose a third one, I think I'm going to say, I think the ones that truly define the X-Men are the Sentinels. Um, because how often is it that you have humans who actually hate something so human, superhuman so much that they build these weapons of mass destruction that could easily kill humans while trying to kill mutants just as a way to keep them in line and just oppress them. But the other thing is the Sentinels are an example of sentient technology gone wrong because eventually, as soon as the Sentinels came online, they went rogue and decided that, well, well, mutants are spawned from humans and humans do their own bad thing. So we might as well just kill them all and rule over them. And that creates the day as a future past timeline. Another essential timeline that Marvel and the X-Men are famous for, which all other timelines branch out from. And plus, you know, the Sentinels, the thing, what I like from a design point, point standpoint, the purple and pink, like robotic humanoid color scheme is just so comic book. I mean, you, you could probably try, you could try applying that to a live action, but we've never gotten that. And it probably is only something that works in a comic book, but it's just like, it works. And I, I, it, the only time I've ever seen it brought to life is in the animated series. And the, that's the 90s one. That's the only time it's ever really truly stayed faithful. And the Which we will like, see again because Disney Plus is putting it on. Um, yeah. I think as far as the color scheme, I'll bet you anything they couldn't color them all blue because then it would have been too obvious that they were just a metaphor for cops. Or shield. Oh. Um, yeah, and by the way, in the Marvel Universe, if you have any sentient technology... There's no way it's not going to kill everybody. Like it all, like it just always does. Um, okay, John, what are some uh, two or three other villains that, that you could think of from the X Men that are sort of definitional? Um, so I guess uh, oldest to youngest, um, it's going to be the uh, Hellfire Club. Um, th they were different than other previous mutant groups. They had so much style. They did. Oh my <laughs> goodness. And. Um, and, and again, it uh, twisted who and what they were. Um, it uh, showed what uh, the abuse of power could be or the, the acquisition of power was all about. Um, and, and again, flowing from that, it meant the whole thing with the White Queen, joining the X-Men, um, uh, the corruption of Jean Grey, everything that sprung from that. I meant that's, Wasn't you know, that's actually Madeline Pryor, not Jean Grey. Nope. It was Jean Grey because she became the, the, uh, the dark Phoenix. And that lit, led it into my second one again, chronologically is the dark Phoenix. Um, because that, uh, again, um, they'd had contact with the Shi'ar, but, uh, that brought them up to, uh, uh, galactic level, villains and threats and uh so again she was a founding member and uh was corrupted and uh how her death and everything that led up to that changed them and you know the marvel universe and then my third one is uh mr sinister um the creepiest craziest non-mutant non non-mutant mutant that uh that existed um i never liked his design um i i like it more now uh but um at the time i i, I didn't like it the the pointy metal teeth and and everything like that but just the idea that he was a geneticist and how old he was and and then again his ties with apocalypse even um and he was like know, he was an evil like example of Charles Xavier. Like you took like a fascination with genetics and mutants farther than Charles Xavier did. He like he didn't care about rights. He just cared about unlocking the potential of the mutant gene. Okay, and I have a serious question. What is essentially the difference between the High Evolutionary and Mister Sinister? Nothing. Are they not basically the same character? Yes, really, they are. I, I you know I never thought of that, but 
I think the only thing the only thing different is didn't the high evolutionary basically become an energy life form or something like that at one point? Yeah, but who doesn't once or twice? That, uh, that's I, true. Always, I always looked at it as like the higher evolutionary had more grander schemes to go on. Like his was always more conquer the world, change the world for the better kind of thing. Like he was a grander, like take over the world kind of deal. But Mr. Sinister is more down to earth that he didn't necessarily just want to take over the world. He just wanted to do his experiments. It, it's a difference between a villain like the Joker and then someone like Apocalypse, essentially. Maybe that's stretching. And he does. Have, he does have his own mountain, uh, Wonder Gore. And by the way, one thing about the Hellfire Club: as much as you should on the hell, you got to shit on the Hellfire Club for being villains and terrible people. Like if you were invited to one of their parties, you'd go. Like that's a. I'll bet they throw one hell of a of a banger of a party. And the thing is, like they had a class structure when it came to mutants. Like you, it wasn't enough that you had to be mutant and powerful. You had to have class. You had to like come from a specific background. You had to. You had to have an ascot. What? <laughs> an ascot like what what freddie uh used to yeah. wear and like like sebastian but, shaw but um what was donald donald pierce is that the one he was uh he was just a cyborg but he wasn't a mutant though but he had money and in, in class i think i get donald pierce mixed up with jason wingard but i don't know jason anyway, Wingard's uh, the... he's the he's the one who controls people the the mastermind right Yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, all right, Jim. Uh, what are a couple of their villains? And again, it's it's funny with the X Men. Like we could probably keep going around two more villains for the next, you know, two hours because there's so freaking many of these things. Uh, but what are some other villains that you know, two or three other villains that we haven't mentioned yet? So I'm just gonna uh, double down on the Hellfire Club because I feel like uh, they're a great foil for the X Men because of what we were just talking about. They're so entitled. They're so decadent, which is so not what the X-Men about, the X-Men are about, you know, being marginalized. And the Hellfire Club is like, if you're rich enough, it doesn't matter. It's okay to be mutant because we're rich. <laughs> and they were basically an upper class, like high society X-Men because they had their own uh, X-Men group with the Hellions. And that was, that always went horribly no matter how many times they tried to do it. Um, so the one villain that I was going to bring up, a favorite of mine is Juggernaut. Uh, I love that he's uh, Xavier. It's half brother, right? Yes, yeah, step brother. Step, step brother. <clears throat> and I love that there's just bad inner family feelings, and you know he's tremendously strong. He has magical powers instead of mutant powers. He's got his crazy weird helmet that stops Xavier from messing with his head. And uh, exactly. another aspect that I love about him is that he's not like uh, he's not an evil mastermind. He's kind of simple. He's really easily manipulated. He likes to punch things in people. He's a team buster who just wants destruction. So exactly. I had three that I did. You have any others you want to mention? Because it you're, that kind of leads directly into three that I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, and they they represent what I sort of just think about as three of the important aspects of the X Men. So the first one is the Juggernaut. And so this leads right into that. And so why do I mention the juggernaut? Because the juggernaut, juggernaut met, uh, sort of meets the, the primary role of one of the important things in the X-Men, which is family drama. Because there's so much family drama throughout all the X-Men. And the juggernaut first is introduced. I didn't realize he was a soul. He goes back to 1965. X-Men number 12. I didn't know we went back that far. And so it's like basically right from the beginning, the X-Men was all about family drama. <laughs> And I just think that's so perfect because like, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's my stepbrother. He was from my mom. It's like, yeah, that's the way the X-Men is going to be for the next 50 years is <laughs> people explaining how they're related to the people that are trying to kill us. Um, the next one is uh, Sauron. Um, and that uh, represents the aspect of the X-Men that is just weird. It's a pterodactyl vampire from a jungle in the South Pole. I mean, yeah like Weird. who pitched that and how much acid had they been doing when they pitched that just like it's uh, like roy T roy thomas T and uh and neil adams right that makes sure sure and uh, by the way i don't say that in a negative way i say that in a positive way because here's what i want to see in a movie theater a pterodactyl vampire from a jungle on the south pole yes give me that give me the give me a you know give me a whole film based on that uh, and the last one, which is something that the X-Men, this is the thing kind of unfortunate about the X-Men, um, 
sort of getting into the into the realm of trying to be trendy. And so the 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 villain to me that that represents the most is the brood because the brood is just aliens. It's yes. just aliens where they slant, changed him just a little bit because they came over them in 82 and aliens came out in 70, what, eight or whatever. And aliens probably came out in like 81. And they were like, make that except not quite that. And that's the brood. It's like, it's the aliens, but they're not, they're, ju- they're, they're not technically the aliens. So there you go. Um, I was going to get back to one of the points that Alex made, uh, which was the X-Men could have their own universe. And um, I don't remember exactly what period of time this was, whether it was the early 90s or the early 2000s. But I remember walking into a comic book store and saying, huh, about a third of the store is DC, a third of the store is mainline Marvel, and a third of the store is just X-Men books. Like they were, they'd have those they'd have those big sprawling storylines that were 20 books and then each book had an offshoot book and it's like i mean the 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 uh the book that i remember trying to buy and this was back before i knew about comic book shops you just buy them like at walmart or whatever and trying to read executioner's song where uh strife goes back disguised as cable to kill charles xavier i think yeah, that story mine never really made sense to me. I only read it in bits and pieces, yeah. and like I don't understand what's going on. Uh, and not to be yeah. confused with these, which which the uh, <clears throat> which the one where Legion went back to try to kill Magneto, but he accidentally killed Xavier. Uh, oh, uh, Age of Apocalypse. Is an Age of Apocalypse start with with Legion killing Xavier? I don't remember. I think it does. I don't know. Fact check me in the comments. Um, yeah, it's man, those stories are so big and there's so many offshoots. And then each new thing, each new timeline introduces five new characters. Like, yeah, Blink, which Blink was never in the mainline universe. She was just created as like an offshoot character. And then it's like, oh man, I guess that's one question to just have everybody answer. Is the, are, is the X-Men good? <laughs> I think there is a lot of good stuff about the X-Men and I do like a lot about them, but I do also think that they are like by far the most complicated to try and understand who's who and who's with who and who's a future version of their past somebody. I, well, I, go ahead. I, I was going to say uh, one of the, the key things so far with the, th- these rogues galleries that we've identified, I know that we've only just gone through two so far is how large and how long they've been around. So like with the X-Men, I I compare it to like with a legion of superheroes in that there's, again, a legion of these characters. And so so because of that, it brings in all these other villains and things like that. But what makes it different, what makes them different from the other ones is it was civilians that like the X-Men or, or were brought into comics because of the X-Men. So they commercialized and capitalized on it. And so, you know, it, it diluted the brand. Um, so I, I would say, no, it's not. And again, you know, that's kind of curmudgeon me talking, but. Um, but the other the, thing on top of that is if you're talking about the nineties, you also had like the Wildcats. Um, and there's a whole bunch of other image stuff that's like, very similarly drawn because it was Jim some Lee. Of the same people um and like very similarly written to like the x-men um and so like even if you weren't reading the x-men you were kind of reading the x-men anyway in the 90s but but again where where did those go D- you know there but but again um you know marvel you know again i'll say has that age so you know their roots are are deeper so um, it's it's kept it's kept them going that much longer than than the image those image guys. But again, it's you know it's caught on. People have liked it. But but again, I really think it's diluted the I, I, uh, the strengths or the the main purpose of the X Men, which, which again you know was the, the issue of oppression and and uh, um, racism and. And, and everything uh so oh, yeah i agree with that. like the, the the message behind the x-men is probably the strongest of any of the you know including the fantastic four and the avengers the the strongest sort of imagery and the strongest message but 
man, it gets diluted over time. Yes. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Jim. Uh, I was just going to say, I feel like when the X-Men is, in my opinion, when the X-Men has done well, it's one of the best books to read. Unfortunately, a lot of times it's not done well for a long period of time. Um, so like um, at the end of the original run from like issue 500 through, I don't know where it ended, like 544, I thought that was a really tremendous, solid run. But <clears throat> if you went back and read every issue that I picked up from like 400 to close to 500, I was like, why, are, <laughs> why am I reading this? Um, so it's, uh, it's not very consistent. Well, taking off from that, the thing that gets, and I'll, by the way, I'll take the hatred. I hate new X-Men. I thought it was one of the worst runs on the X-Men ever. Despise it. Um, so throw all the hate comments my way. Um, but it does illustrate how the X-Men and like how you say when they're done well, how different they are depending on who's writing them. Um, and how, uh, I mean, a lot of that 90s stuff is so soap opera -y. I mean, there are just long long issues or even whole arcs about like who's dating who and oh i can't let somebody find out that i'm thinking about dating somebody else when i'm really thinking about dating this other person and it's like can somebody just punch somebody in the face oh well, i, that like, always makes I me don't care that. who cyclops wants to date i like cyclops as a character but can we just punch somebody he should shoot somebody with his eye laser that's why he has an eye laser well, it's just like, well, remember the whole thing with Rogue and, and Magneto? <laughs> Again, soap opera. And, well, I mean, and, Jubilee was a vampire for a while. Oh, was she? Why? Why was that, why was that a thing? Well, doesn't yeah, she have was, a baby now? Yeah. Is it a baby vampire? Could no, it be? It's baby. It's adopted. It's not even hers. It's an adopted baby that she took on her away. Maybe she adopted it from Dracula. Speaking of vampires, I'm not really excited about Blade coming back to the Marvel Universe and being in the Marvel Universe because I assume that means we're going to get vampires and all sorts of things. I think they're pretty good at keeping things compartmentalized. And I think Mahershala Ali is a really, really good actor. So I'm going to keep my hopes up for the time being. Um, <laughs> but yeah. that, that, so will he spin off from like Doctor Strange? Will Doctor Strange appear? No, uh, no I think he's... So he's already appeared, by the way. If you were, if you use your ears, he was in Eternals, uh, in the post-credit scene, talking to the Black Knight. Yeah, he's talking oh. to Black Knight. Oh, I didn't realize that. I didn't either. I had to look it up. I'm, but uh, I don't know when he's first going to pop up. But I know uh, uh, Dane Whitman is going to be in Blade and a part of that story. So I don't know if he's going to sort of hook up with the Eternals in some way or how that's going to work. Um, speaking of, since, since we're talking Eternals and. Blade and Black Knight. Um, so say what you want about the Eternals, but ever since that movie came out with um, Thor and just every, and it's WandaVision, it just, it seems like Marvel is laying the ground universe for the next Avenger roster to be the 90s Avengers roster with Black, well, there was like the bomber jacket era, but like probably more superhero. And I'm so many pouches. <laughs> And I'm interested to see what they do with that because that's the one era of the Marvel Universe that's never been adapted like in other media like live action or animated or video game. So I'm very interested to see what will be done with that because I have a feeling it's going to work like the Guardians of the Galaxy did. Like no one is, everyone is completely unaware that this probably era existed. They're probably more familiar with the classic Avengers or modern Avengers. They have no idea this era existed. And they're going to see this done. It's like, okay, this is new. This is exciting. I like this. This is Guardians game. Let's do this. Well, the '90s Avengers definitely were not the ones are not the ones people think about. Uh, for again, for better or worse. So it, it, could, it, be, uh, it could be '90s uh, West Coast Avengers too, with Moon Knight or Great Lakes Avengers. Great Lakes Avengers. <laughs> I would All right, uh, Jim. Let's move on. To, what what uh, Rose Gallery would you like to talk about? Uh, so I chose Captain America. He does not have a very powerful rogues gallery. God, are um, you listening? Yeah. <laughs> Scott is like a, a big Captain America fan. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Continue. So does Cap Wolf count as a villain or just as a uh, an alternate version of himself? Who? Does Cap Wolf count as a, diff as a villain or an alternate I, version? I gotta tell you, I don't even know who Cap Wolf is. I, Mike, sometimes when we talk comics, it's 
it's so weird because I read comics from like 1980 to 1992 religiously. And then I kind of fell off and I didn't really start again until 2010. So I feel like when you were really reading comic books was when I really, really wasn't. But I think Cat Cat Wolf was 80s, isn't he? I don't know. Uh, You know, it seems like it was late 80s is is kind of what I remember. Okay. Anyway, you talk Captain America and I'll find more about Cat Wolf. So um, it just struck me how many of the characters are um, not that everything should be based in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but that were major characters in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, Red, Red Skull, Baron Zemo, who seems like is going to be an ongoing uh, villain in the MCU. Oh, man, he's, he's, he is so cool. I, I mean, I, I just could not believe how much I liked that. His swagger, yeah. everything exactly. about him. Um, uh, Viper, and I think the character that, um, I can't remember her name. Uh, the lady that's interacting with the U.S. agent, and the, oh, uh, the one played by the Seinfeld actress. Oh, uh, that is the Valentina. Contessa. Contessa. Uh, yeah, yeah, she's she was uh, Nick Fury's love interest in. Which Nick somebody Fury. should say her name. I just I said the first part of it, but I, I can't remember. There's it's uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus, but I don't remember the Valentina. Uh, isn't she like a count or something? Yeah, she's Countess. Valentina something but so can you guys correct me is that Viper or is that somebody else she, no, that's no, she is that that's not Viper okay Viper is she's like has green like a green uniform and green hair and green lipstick right. so was she, she part of the serpent serpent squad or whatever that was and was leader of Hydra for a while right I get her I gotta be real honest is she Madam Hydra or is she a different character are those two different characters? That's a different character, I'm pretty sure. Okay. I will look it up. But yeah. Also, another Captain America villain. Um, Baron Von Strucker wasn't around for very long, but he was in the Marvel movies. Uh, Armin Zola was in several. Batrock the Leaper. Um, <clears throat> uh, Winter Soldier, I think, was a great uh, villain for a while in the comics. Um, and then... He kept it, also had a whole cast of characters that they came up with when they did the invaders and kind of told new stories about World War II. So there was a master man and warrior woman who were uh, super powered Nazis. There was Baron Blood, who was a vampire. I, I remember I remember getting that invaders issue with Baron Blood at a grocery store when I was a kid and I was like, this guy is super creepy. <clears throat> He's got like uh, little flaps under his arms. He flies yeah. around. By the way, kind of uh, colored, Cap- like, kinda co- colored like the Sentinels. I think he's a little uh, purple and pink. Viper uh, is... Contessa Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, uh, created by uh, the great Jim Steranko, 1967. Uh, the Viper, it, she is Madame Hydra. Okay. And there have been a few Madame Hydras. Yes. But again, she was cre- guess who she was created by? Jim Stranko. <laughs> um, Cap also has a Serpent Society. Uh, not a big fan of them. I, I think Serpent that. Society first appears in the Avengers, though. That's true, they do. Um, I mean, he was in the Avengers the- at the time, so it doesn't not invalid. Did that fall into the Serpent Crown thing? No, I think it's two different things. Okay. Yeah, I think the Serpent Society are just villains that like to be serpents. Like, uh, oh, you Cobra. know what? I think right, they didn't first appearance in. I'm thinking of something different. Serpent Society did first appear in Captain America. That's 1985. Uh, I was thinking of something else, and I don't know what I was thinking of. Uh, oh, I I know yeah. what you're thinking of, but I don't know what they're called. It's they were on like issue 30 in the Avengers. Yeah, something like that. Shortly after it, they went to sort of the the weak quote unquote Avengers where all the big hitters left and it was just like Cap and Scarlet Witch and Quicksilver and uh Hawkeye, I think. Yeah, and Hawkeye became um Goliath. Um and then he had I the saw... worst costume that anybody's ever had for a while. Yeah. Uh I saw Taskmaster listed as a villain for Captain America and I wasn't really sure where to put Taskmaster. I want 
didn't really remember a lot of Taskmaster stories. I, I only remember him with the Avengers. Um, he's, also, uh, uh, most Crossbones. recently, I feel like he's been associated with Deadpool, but yeah, he's done a lot of Deadpool. Uh, Crossbones too. Oh yeah, I was going to mention him. And, oh, Red and uh, what's that? And, and Red Skull's daughter five. too. Uh, uh, yeah, we're, just to, just so you know, people, we're, we're very old and we forget basically everything. <laughs> we know things. I'm I'm not agree. So I was also going to mention Johnny Walker, U.S. agent, as a <sighs> villain. And then there's don't mind if I do. Anti-DM mechanics and Hydra. Oh yes. And and Modoc, that that's where Modoc appeared too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yep. An organism designed only for killing. It was originally computing. Wasn't it originally supposed to be a C, but then he changed it to a K? Yeah. I don't know. It probably one of my least favorite villains of all time. I like uh, the design. First appeal appears in Tales of Suspense number ninety three. Is that was that the book that was half Cap and half somebody else? Yes. Yeah. Then you have like lesser known ones like Black Smasher and um, Hate Monger. No, uh, interesting thing on Hate Monger, he originally appeared in Fantastic Four. Right. And they made him to like a, a Cap villain, right? Pretty much so, because he was a clone of uh, Hitler. Yeah, you got the you got the Watchdogs, the uh, the Secret Empire, Roxxon. Uh, basically, all of Cap's villains were basically something that stood against the American Dream. Right. Well, they used to stand against the American Dream. I would argue that Hate Monger is now a mainstream. He's pulling well. Yeah. Then you had like lesser ones that had nothing to do with America, like Porcupine and Armadillo. No, uh, Porcupine. No, I, I don't remember. Either he was Ant Man, but he also appeared in uh, X Men too. The Porcupine well, I did. I can't remember which one. It's either Porcupine or Armadillo ended up dating uh, Spider Woman in her book when she was kind of like doing a detective. It was Porcupine. Thing. It was a porcupine, and that was actually a really good book. I enjoyed that quite a bit. I think it was uh, well. I'm never going to remember a writer's name. I apologize, writer who wrote that book. I appreciate what you did, and I cannot remember your name. I apologize. Oh, by the way, one of the I think probably the most important villain that maybe we haven't mentioned is the Winter Soldier. Um, oh, oh, Jim, Jim did. Yeah, but I didn't hear it, so it didn't count. Oh, okay. Exactly. Go on. Tell us about the Winter Soldier. No, he's great. He's, 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 uh, the comics great. He's great in the in the movies. He's just he's a really really good villain. I, I, I have to admit, I was mad at first when they introduced him because uh, he and Uncle Ben at that <laughs> time were the only ones that had not been brought back to life. <laughs> and um, it's just like, why, why did you do this? But And Frank Gwen to... Stacy too at the time, right? Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, I forgot about her. You're, you're right. Um, but an incredible villain. I meant... Uh, I mean, that was just an example of good writing right there. Done right. Yeah. Who, who, cr who created him? Was it Steve something or whatever? Steve Englehart? Right, we got a sick puppy. Uh-oh. No. He'll be all right. He's got a upset stomach. Uh, I'll, I'll check. A, uh, I just who created who? Winter, uh, Soldier. Winter, Winter Soldier. Well, oh, uh, Brubaker. Uh, Brubaker. Uh, okay. Well, that, technically, the, the original creator would be the original. Well, Batman. it would have been, uh, what, Simon and... Uh, uh, Kirby. Kirby and, yeah, Kirby and Simon. Um, but like the, the sort of character we know today was, was Ed Brubaker. And I don't remember who the artist was. I should always remember the artist, but I don't. It's one of those things, just a personal pet peeve. It's always infuriating when people are like, uh, the guy that created Deadpool, the co-created Deadpool, but they always just say he created him with the no feet. Uh, Rob Liefeld. Rob Liefeld. But it's like, no, there was two people that created Deadpool and only one of them was Rob Liefeld. The other was Fabian Nicieza, who I find to be a much nicer person. I think it's kind of weird. Um, in the 80s and early 90s, I feel like everyone talked about the artists and now everyone talks about the writers. I think that's one of those things. It's, it's always kind of in flux a little bit. And I think we're definitely in a writer heavy period <clears throat> at the moment. I think um, also it's like in the 80s and 90s, the art styles were a little more unique. 
You know, it's like everyone was trying to be the next big comic artist and everyone had their own style in a sort of sense. Yeah. Well, so, a lot of people, I think, say that's why Valiant was kind of, it didn't, wasn't a bigger success at the time because they sort of put more emphasis on the stories and the writing uh, than they did on the art, which was a good thing from a narrative perspective, but not a great thing from a sales perspective, unfortunately. But now they've, they've gotten it right. Now they're one of the big comic companies. Well, I don't know if they'd be big exactly, but they're, well, I mean, big they're holding on anyway. Big um, indie wise. So I guess we kind of, I kind of skipped over doing the definitional films, but we kind of, I think we kind of did that throughout the conversation. Does anybody have anything else specific to say about the, the, the uh, Captain America villains that Jim mentioned, but I just didn't hear. And therefore I had to talk. <laughs> so, so for, for me, uh, you know, I knew who Captain America was as a kid, you know, late seventies, early eighties, but it was the invaders um, and reading the invaders that really, uh, got me into cap and so anytime that he fought nazis or, or anything like you know that the fascista type character um always takes him back to his roots so i always that that's always the the definitive stuff for me so you know even though this the red skulls changed over the years and and things like that uh, again it's um when it's those menaces like that that um uh, i think think he's at his best and defines him the best um on that note um for me cap i always felt cap did have an extensive rose gallery but i think the problem with captain america i just want to go on record and say he's one of my favorite like superheroes ever like he's my favorite avenger but i think the problem is that most writers fail with captain america and, and his rogues why they don't stand out is because they're always trying to push the American ideals or sense of patriotism with the character. I mean, which I get because he's the iconic American superhero aside from Superman. But the thing is like, when you try to push the sense of patriotism or nationalism with a character, it just, it, like, it, it feels like you're kind of shoehorning, like trying to force that in and it doesn't work. I mean, the thing about with Cap, what I always felt was worked best about Captain America, which I think the MCU gets right, is that he's not necessarily a, a patriot. He's just a, a guy who wants to do the right thing. He wants to stand up for the little guy. He wants to make sure everyone's treated right. I mean, they even said this in the first movie, uh, the first Avenger. He says, like, I don't want to kill anyone. I just don't like bullets. You know, he, nev he, he never once mentioned he wanted to fight for his country or just or fight for the American dream. He just didn't like how the Nazis were attacking and hurting people. And, that, and then that carries on into Winter Soldier and Civil War. And that, it's not about the American dream. He's, he's doing this in a sense of like, he's just trying to stop a wrong thing like from happening. And if the writers could do that, if they could, like, if they just, if they just focus on making these villains, not about opposing the American dream, but instead of just doing what really makes them stand out and says that like AIM is about ruling the world through super science, like Hydra is all about like, supremacy um uh the secret empire is about uh, capitalism ruling everything and even the serpent society is all of, it, it's basically a you it's a superhuman union they got together because they were tired of being like pushed around being guy and not making enough money so they unionized and became a group that looked after each other they were basically the rogues of like the flashes rogues of captain america's rogues Gallery. And I think if people just like focus on putting those things first and having tr Captain trying to stop them and overcoming them, that would help them stand out more. Oh, and one villain I forgot to bring up is a modern one, Mr. Bubbles or whatever his name was. The guy who had that weird bubble thing on his hat. It was like a modern villain. Not familiar with that one. <laughs> He's not probably know that one. Um, no, I'm a huge fan of Cap. I think he's great. I think it's uh, one of the things just to you know, <clears throat> briefly sort of go outside of comics i think one one problem that people have with comics is the idea that oh you're looking for this hero to come and save you and i don't think that's the idea behind comics and especially the idea behind heroes i think captain america we're not supposed to wait for captain america to come save us captain america is supposed to be an ideal that you're trying to live up to so you're not waiting for captain america you're trying to be the most captain america person you can be in your own life um, and I find it frustrating when people say that or, or think that, you know, liking comics and liking heroes is, is somehow 
you know, waiting for a hero. And it's like, no, it's telling us how we should be heroes. And so yeah. Captain America is somebody who sort of leads by example. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with that all superheroes would be. They should be the best of us. They should be like inspiring us to be the best we can be, even if they have flaws or hindrances that they're trying to overcome, you know? It's like, we're not necessarily waiting around for them. We see them and we want to be just like them. So I think the one that I'm going to bring up is one that I, spoiler alert, don't particularly like. Um, and it is one, it, to, to go one step further in my discussion of this, I have never read a comic book from this particular series, uh, except for, I, well, I probably did in the 90s when I was young, but I don't remember it. And I'm basing a lot of what I'm saying in this on the HBO cartoon show, which if people know this, then they've tipped my hand. Um, and that is Spawn. Um, and Spawn, as much as I may have some problems with with uh, the creator, Todd McFarlane, um, it's a great rose gallery. Like, he has a ton of really, really great villains. Um, the ones I sort of wrote down that I remember kind of off the top of my head uh, was Billy Kincaid, um, Chapel, The Violator, Malbolgia, Malbolgia uh, Sam and Twitch kind of villains, I guess. I mean, they're the cops that are kind of trying to find him. Um, the art's pretty good. Um, yeah, just a really good uh, rogues gallery. I don't know. What are your guys' experience with Spawn? Is, I mean, you guys remember I him really being in the 90s? Read, I don't know that I've read any Spawn. Who's the uh, who's the cybernetic ape? There's the cybernetic guy. I don't. I was trying to think of his name and I could not think of it. Wait, is it this? Is it this? But it. But isn't that from uh, Savage Dragon? Savage Dragon, that ape. I thought that was from Hellboy. I mean, I remember the crossover <clears throat> between Hellboy and Savage Dragon. They're fighting this guy. You well, know? I don't Savage, know. I I don't even remember his name. I, I'd look it up if I could remember his name, but I can't. In in um. With the the in Hellboy, there was a there was a German officer that was was in one of those uh, um, tank. His head was in the tank, like in um, Futurama, right. and he was plugged into an ape's body. It is um, overt kill, overt, overt kill. kill. And the only the only spawn I ever read was uh, was issue one. And I got a, and I got that at at Chica Chicago Wizard World a long time ago. And the guy that was Todd Mc that Todd McFarlane had based the character on um, was there with uh, the Spawn Mobile or whatever, and he was giving these out for free and signing them. Um, so that's the only one I ever read. So that I. I don't have a lot of comment. I, I saw the movie and I thought it was just okay. Um, I thought, I mean, the, the cartoon show from the night from, uh, well, yeah, it'd be nineties, probably uh, mid to late nineties. Uh, they did it on HBO. And it was funny because I originally bought the edited version on accident and it was like super, super chopped down, which by the way, if you've seen the spawn cartoon, just imagine watching that, like an, uh, an all ages version of that. It's like, they cut out like, 25 percent of every episode at least um because it's like cursing every other word and people get their arms ripped off and stuff so then I, I went back and i bought the unedited version and i was like this is the coolest thing that i've ever seen in my entire life because it was like 1997 um and it was like spawn like breaking somebody's arm and throwing them off a building with chains and stuff and it was um i mean the funny thing is he's you know so there's a there's a character in uh marvel called night watch I think, is that his name? The one that's basically just the spawn. Like he literally is just spawn in the MCU or in, not in the Marvel universe. It was Marvel um, trying to capitalize on spawn. But the thing is like, if, if you know, Todd McFarlane was going to complain too much. I mean, a whole bunch of spawn is kind of just daredevil. I mean, there's a lot of daredevil in that, in that character. Um, so I don't know if he, if he sued, then, you know, it kind of could, could have gone back on him. See, I um, always thought, I thought, thought he was kind of more like the specter you know, DC Spectre event, you know, the police officer that, that died and came back being the vengeance of, you know. Well, of, I mean, he's also like, he's a little bit Spider-Man and he's a little bit Batman too. And a little bit Ghost Rider. Yeah. I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of an amalgamation. I, I, I think that Todd McFarlane is a, a talented artist. Um, I don't know if he's a particularly talented writer. Um, and I, you see, I think they pick at you, but he did, he did make a good rose gallery. Uh, Angela. Uh, who later was sent back to the Marvel universe for detention. Um, 
door and, sister now right which that's all the, the story behind that just google that the whole story behind it is really really fascinating um and you know the uh uh, uh chapel who's sort of like this evil government assassin guy is really good in it and the clown is great um i think john torturo not john torturo sorry uh john leguizamo um did a reasonably good job or as good a job as he could have done with that part in the movie i think in the cartoon he does a lot the the, the voice actor does a lot better job just because it's a it's a cartoon um billy kincaid is this you know giant serial killer and who runs a a uh uh ice cream truck and he's very very ominous and awful and i mean the whole thing about spawn is like everybody's awful in spawn um it's interesting we were talking about jason uh wingard who is the mastermind of the marvel universe and of course the big villain cia villain in spawn is jason win um which i always thought was a little ballsy to just take off guard um <laughs> but you know as much as I kind of talk crap about it, it, it is an interesting universe. And I think he has, whether or not the writing in the book is great is sort of beside the point. He has created an interesting universe that I think people, you know, find compelling. Uh, and there's a lot of really good villains in there. Admittedly, I don't know too much about Spawn, but I really want to get into them. I have the first two omnibuses that I've been meaning to read because I want to learn from what I, as a writer, I want to learn from what I consider the indie masters, like those who have created superheroes that don't belong to Marvel DC and are still going strong to this day and have left their mark almost as big as those guys have. So like the creators of like Robert Kirkman with Invincible or Eric Larson with uh, uh, Savage Dragon, of course, Todd McFarlane with Spawn. And the fact that Spawn is like been a superhero that stood the test of time and is still going strong to this day it is recently getting more attention than ever. It's like, I consider that, say what you want about Todd McFarlane and his work, but I mean, and the, as the guy, but Anyone who can like make it against the big two with a with a single character has my respect. Um, well, you... the other thing is, if you're looking at at sort of early creators, um, then you'll very much like Spawn because there's a lot of other people that sub in writing duties for Spawn. Uh, Neil Gaiman does, I think. I can't tell you exactly who else does, but there's a lot of other sort of big creators that do the sort of uh, you know sub in um, on that book. And I'm trying to bring it up, and it's not coming up properly. Did you get those omnibuses at at in Baltimore? Me? No, I got them in Mayhem. Okay. Did you bring those when you went to Baltimore? I did, but I was so busy, like, meeting the creators and doing okay. that stuff, I never got around to reading them. I'm just okay. starting to crack them up. I, I honestly, I, I'm still working on Savage Dragon, which I really have been really enjoying. Because I, well, Savage I re- Dragon's still going on, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, he is. So is Spawn, and I'm sure if Kirkman stuck with it, he could keep Invincible going for a long time. I think Kirkman's I, probably making all the money he ever needs to make off of The Walking Dead. Well, I, I also appreciate the ball was the way his heart was. So I was just going to say, I also appreciate that uh, he had a story to tell with Invincible and he told it and then it was done. I, I think that's like, um, I'll always go back to Starman um, with James Robinson. Uh, he told his stories, was done in 75 issues. And I love that nobody's picked it up and and tried to do anything else with it but you know with that character it, um you know th- they've tried to do that with uh sandman and they're all very inferior the story's been very inferior to the neil game and stuff uh, yeah wesley well the, 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 the netflix series comes out i think uh very soon next In week August. maybe Pretty soon. um and Neil Gaiman said there, and, and I've seen some shot to shot comparisons, and they are very much saying close to the book. Also, uh, Audible uh, did a an audio uh, presentation of Sandman, which is very, very close to the, I mean, I don't know if it's exactly word perfect, but it's very, very close to the original story. And they got really, really good voice talent in there. So it's, it's very, and, very much and, worth checking out. And Neil Gaiman uh, narrates the other, uh, there's two, yeah. two, two of those uh, audio books out or audio adventures. And just to yeah, be and clear, so far I think they're the, like I, th- the I think the, the audio not the Wesley Dodds DC character with the gas mask and who was basically Green Hornet. Yeah, but no, no, it's not 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 that same man. But um, although he does pop up in it, yes, because he is a fragment of the Sandman soul. The, he's the anthropomorphication of uh, dreaming. Isn't that how he got his like prep condition powers through dreaming? Like he was part of the isn't that what they wrote in or something? Yeah, I mean, well, it's complicated, but yeah. Um, so the the Sandman, um, and there's no word on on how far the first season of the Netflix show is going to go. I would guess maybe the first graphic novel. 
Well, it sounds like it's the, the first story arc and then the second story arc, which is um, Dollhouse, uh, because they've made reference to Desire and she doesn't appear until the second story arc. Um, I just remember I read through that or read the audio recently. I, I love that one. So I, I think that's just done. By the way, uh, uh, Alex, for your information, uh, Neil Gaiman wrote uh, issues, I think, eight and nine of Spawn. Before that, Alan Moore wrote a couple of issues. Uh, David Sim writes issue 10 or nine and 10. That's Frank like, Miller I, writes 11. He did Cerebrus is uh, David Sims. So there's there's a whole bunch of people that come in as, as sort of guest writers on that book. It's it's pretty interesting. And if you want to, again, independent comics is is Cerebrus. If you ever get a hold of those, that that early the early stuff is really good. But you're talking telephone book, old old style telephone book, thick omnibuses of of his stuff. John, you're gonna have to explain what a telephone book is. Oh. I understand what a telephone book is. <laughs> And honestly, I mean, if it means I can learn and grow as a writer from reading that stuff, it'll be worth it. I, it it's, it's great stuff. It really is. And it's it's classic. Um, I mean, you know, some of it was written in the uh, late 70s, so there's uh, some dated material, but um, but otherwise it's great stuff. And it's called also, Cerebrus? Yes, he's an aardvark. I'm just sort of uh, uh, perusing through the salmon stuff. Greg Capullo apparently has done a ton of art for Spawn. Yeah, like a, like a whole bunch of it. Uh, he's a very very talented artist. I love his stuff. Um, all right, just real quickly, I think we sort of talked about these. Uh, not a lot of. I, I feel weird because I really wanted to mention Spawn because I think it deserves to be mentioned in a, in a list like this because he does have a really good rogues gallery, uh, and I really wish we had somebody here who knew more about it and liked it more than I did. Uh, and I do I do like it. I do, I love the story. I like the character a lot. Uh, I just didn't read the comics a lot. Um, so, John, do you have any just kind of real quick uh, offhand mentions you'd like to, to bring in that, that you feel like we should talk about? Sure. Uh, um, I, want, galleries? I, I wanted to bring in the Legion. Um, and it again, it falls under that category of like the X-Men in the Fantastic Four uh, is that there's so many characters and it brings in solo adventures and brought, brought in so many of uh, their villains. I mean, it's everything from, you know, Superman to... Uh, the, the new gods to um uh well i guess you'd have to even go back with dr fate with mordru uh the magician but um time tracker yep and the really i meant uh and the fatal five but um again that that large group large villain or you know superpowered or I almost would say overpowered uh, villains that could take on a whole huge team. Um, and the other, the other team I was going to talk about was um, the original Doom Patrol. Um, uh, they, you know, just crazy, crazy villains like General Immortus, who was uh, uh, an immortal guy who was out to conquer the world. Um, Gargax, who was uh, an alien that uh, had uh, plastic um, androids and was going to take over the world. Um, and of course, the Brotherhood of Evil. You know, man, should... Little Mineral Man. Yep. yep. Um, and, and again, um, the Brotherhood oh, of Evil Mala. was Monsieur Mala, the, the talking ape, the brain, the disembodied brain, Madame Ro Ro uh, Rouge. Um, Phobia, Mr. Uh, Immortus. Right, th those are the, the the later incarnations of the of the team, um, and, and again, uh, they were, you know, would be world beaters that uh, got beat by this uh, kind of ragtag team, um, and, and again, it defined them, and they spilled over into the <clears> Titans, <throat> and uh, you don't, yeah, the, the 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 Titans is the big group that I can think of. Um, hey, John, just out of curiosity, who's scarier? The Frightful Four, the Fatal Five, or the Lethal Legion? Um, the, uh, the, the, um, the Fatal Five is okay. because they have Vandalus, which is a brain inside a huge body with no eyes that shoots lightning and 
is you, and then also the other the other one is is Th thorak whose body split in half it's half human and half uh robot but you can see all the gears and wires and stuff in him <laughs> and you have the the disintegrator guy with the skull dome oh helmet. oh i forgot about yeah um and the emerald empress and the executioner guy um okay. alex uh what other ones did we not talk about that what's another rogues gallery or two that you'd like to do just kind of quick mention on well first i just want to make sure i didn't cut john off i don't know nope. I, nope. I i make an attempt to cut john off at all times <laughs> Okay, well, I have two. One, the, the one, I, the next one I'm going to go off with. It was actually the one I was intending to go with before I remembered the X Men, and that is Invincibles Rogues Gallery. So Robert Kirkman is Invincibles. One of the reasons I like him is because like Invincibles is one of the few modern superheroes who you can say as a definite Rogues Gallery that you can name off. I mean, a lot of the image superheroes of the '90s and early 2000s had villains, but I don't think there's more that you can name off than Invincibles because a lot of those villains really came about naturally in his story arc. They, they weren't just inserted like in the old days, just like one-offs. They all flowed naturally within the story, whether it was the Muller Twins or Thorax or Battle Beast or Langstrom. And Invincible even had some more comic book villain based villains like uh, Blitzkrieg, uh, Furnace, uh, Tether Tyrant, who got his own little spiel. Um, the, the Lizard Legion. He, he had like, he was basically had classic rogues gallery meets modern rogues gallery for a superhero. And it's just like so extensive right up there with Spider-Man and Batman's and, and uh, Flashes. And, and it's just like, it, it really cool. It's like, it's all so unique. And you see how, not only how Invincible changes, but all these villains change within the story too. Rog or Kerman didn't just focus on Invincible, he focused on the villains as well, gave them their own little problems to deal with and things to overcome and how they all intertwined in the end. Yeah, I so I don't know anything about Invincible, but I was hoping somebody would bring them up because I know, especially since the show came out on, is it Amazon Prime? Yeah. yeah. Uh, people have been talking about it a lot. I know it's 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 something that a lot of people really like a lot. I'll, I'm going to check it out one of these days. I just haven't yet. You can find um, it on, you can find it on, online to read because that's how how my sons did and um they're big my son john is a big invincible fan do they call them invincibleites i never so, thought of that uh a lot of the public libraries have the color omnibus editions what's that's a library <laughs> right i was actually gonna complain about the library uh it was the place that i first noticed that uh, artists or uh, authors were being the writers were being elevated because it was like why is the flash under s or <laughs> they didn't have all the flash issues together they had the the writers yeah. stuff together it was so it was like like a library they did it by author like i'll tell you the one that the storyline I, I think the time I first noticed that was when I was reading uh, Jonathan Hickman's Avengers run, which I think is good, but you have to be patient with it because it's Jonathan Hickman and Jonathan Hickman can be a little impervious sometimes. Um, and yeah, I, I like that run. It's not, it's not, it's not a ding against him, but he kind of makes you work for it a little bit when you're reading his stuff. Um, uh, Jim, did you have any other, uh, Actually, I, had, I had one more real quick, just one real quick. Go ahead. So, so um, now, I haven't read much of this character, but I really want to get into it because him and another character have really spawned my interest since they were big in the 90s, and that is Sleepwalker and his rogues gallery. Now, Sleepwalker doesn't have a very extensive rogues gallery as, um, like, all the other superheroes have. Like, I don't know much about it. Like, I only know there's 8-Ball and a few of the Sleepwalker like, people that he deals with. But what I liked about Sleepwalker's rogues gallery is it was an entire original rogues gallery created by the creators for sleepwalker as he wrote it he didn't borrow villains from other marvel super like teams like a lot of marvel writers do like back then or now he every villain he created for a sleepwalker series was created was created specifically for sleepwalker and first appeared in that series you know um, so i and i and i i kind of remember the character but was that in the new universe um, that was it was the it was an early '90s character. It was it was created by um, Bob Budian. 
Budensky and Brett Belvis. Um, so it's the one that like had the, like the character who was like sharing a body with a human who was like protecting the world from the dream world or like mindscape. And um, so uh, yeah, it was. It just seems like it's such a cool character because it was like one of the pinnacle Marvel characters of the '90s, like right up there with Darkhawk. It was like one of those edgy Marvel characters, but it had like the same potential as Spider-Man did. Same that with that Darkhawk was trying to be. Okay, and it just I've... really appeals to me. So. I... I, I did find him. Yeah, that's that's not who that's not what I was thinking it was. Yeah, okay. I don't think it, it's not a new universe book. But it's um, just like I think it I don't again, I never read a Sleepwalker comic. I don't know much of the characters. I only found out about this when I was looking up Rogues Galleries to talk about. But the fact that Sleepwalker had his own like extensive rogues gallery for his entire series that could be put in a list is pretty impressive in my book. That you can't say that a lot of less about a lot of lesser known Marvel characters. Sleepwalker actually worked with uh, Machine Man in uh, The Initiative, which I thought was kind of a fun little yeah. series. And Machine Man's kind of a fun character. Yeah, he is. By the way, yeah. oh, one of the things going to mention, and I, I forgot earlier, when you mentioned Doom Patrol, never read any of the books. I think it's one of the best superhero shows on television. I think that I absolutely love that show. It is a blast and it is weird. It's just, it's so bizarre and I, I really, really like it. Uh, Jim, uh, sort of honorable mention for Good Rogues Gallery. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk, instead of like Alex, with the original cast of characters, somebody that I think uh, did a great job of borrowing a lot of villains and uh, <clears throat> also fighting a lot of heroes, the Hulk. Uh, not one of my favorite characters to read, but uh, Rogues Gallery has got Abomination, uh, the leader. Thunderbolt Ross are really, you know, your classic uh, Hulk villains, but he has a lot of showdowns with Wolverine and Juggernaut. Uh, Absorbing Man, who was, a, a, you know, originally a Thor villain, really, I think, is mostly identified with the Hulk. The Rhino. The Wrecking uh, Crew. The Wrecking Crew, exactly. Uh, Modoc, often is a Hulk villain. Um, and I think <clears throat> two great additions more recently are the Red Hulk and the Maestro. Uh, I, I love that Red Hulk run. I thought it was fantastic. Um, and the Maestro was a really interesting twist. I'm kind of hoping we get to see Maestro in the MCU. Uh, um, a, another villain group that he fought was the UFOs. Which I, I believe never... they're I believe they're the UFOs. Yeah. <laughs> Which I oh, believe. you're right. Yeah. They are. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> Which I cannot believe they have never had that team fight the Fantastic Four. They were all led up to, like, written to be anti Fantastic Four villains, and yet they've never once fought them, as far as I can tell. They're, for some reason, they're meant to be Hulk villains. And I think the only reason they keep them Hulk villains is because they didn't want to make the and Fantastic Four appear ant antagonistic towards the Hulk. So, um, like, um, but Go ahead. Uh, did you have something to say about the Hulk? Just briefly. Um, so the, the run that Al Ewing did, uh, the Immortal Hulk, is just masterful. Um, it is not your typical superhero run. It is sort of a horror comic, um, which I think the Hulk, the Hulk kind of starts off as a horror comic a little bit uh, with the first couple of issues, uh, <clears throat> sci-fi horror. Um, and Al Ewing does a great job. And also I have a great Al Ewing story uh, because it's my favorite Al Ewing story. Um, we were at, uh, I think it was C2E2. Um, and somebody had asked this question about like, what if you only had 20, you found out the earth was was going to end in 24 hours. Um, and Al Ewing's like, well, I probably couldn't get on a plane back to England in time. So I guess I'd just sit here and die. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a great answer. I loved it. I guess I'd just sit here and die. It's fantastic. Um, I have uh, one other honorable mention, and I really don't think the Rogues Gallery is all that good, but I brought it up because uh, I was so impressed reading through it how much one run of the comic impacted the Rogues Gallery, and that's Green Lantern. Um, you know, he's got some some good old, old villains like Sinestro, um, Black Hand, Necron, <laughs> but some of them were relatively minor. Um, 
and going down the, the uh, uh, list, Atrocitus, LaFreeze, uh, Anti-Monitor, Star Sapphire, I mean, she's been around for a while, uh, Cyborg Superman, but they all got tied into the 2005 uh, run uh, where... Is that the Blackest <clears throat> Night? Yeah, but that, that entire run, instead of just having awesome. green lanterns yeah. and yellow lanterns, they're like, let's do the whole spectrum. And they oh. blew out the entire story with tons of new characters. That's new John. Powers. Right? Jeff Johns. Yeah. Man is a genius. Yep. Don't, so tell, just, uh, don't tell Zack Snyder that. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I will be happy to tell Zack Snyder that. I'm in Zack Snyder's face. Um. I just had just two really quick ones to, to mention uh, Daredevil because I think Daredevil has a bunch of really cool villains. And I think sometimes that like your street level heroes in New York kind of they're they're they all just become Spider-Man villains for better or worse because it's like, oh, they're all Spider-Man villains, even if they really aren't. Um, but so like Kingpin, Bullseye, Electra, Tombstone, Typhoid Mary, Purple Man, Punisher. And yes, Punisher is a villain. He just is. Get over it. Um, and the other one, and this goes back to something I think uh, Jim and I were talking about before we started recording, uh, but uh, I mentioned the Guardians of the Galaxy, and here I'm talking about sort of the the, the Abnet and Landing Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, the Annihilation Wave and Annihilation Conquest, um, and then uh, just sort of that that run of those the, that Marvel Cosmic, where they sort of get Abnet and Landing kind of carte blanche to do whatever they want in 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 the Marvel Cosmic, and I think they did a fantastic job. Um, they had, I mean, you get Super Scroll Clert and you get all the what are the, the space wraiths and like just all this really crazy out there stuff and just this really, really amazing artwork. And like I could just I could just read those books cover to cover over and over again. I mean, they were great. Um, and I thought they struck a good balance. And sometimes I think in the New Guardians movies, it gets to the point where there's they they aren't allowed to stick on things being emotional and having feeling and i think in the books that things were you know you do feel things uh and i think that's sort of a weakness of the movies to some degree i don't think james gunn does it to the same extent the taika waititi does um but he does do it and it, it bugs me sometimes where you should things should have space to have emotional weight uh and i think in that book they do where it is and it is fun they are fun they're not like super over serious books i mean serious things happen um and, you know, I mean, just those two books, I mean, Annihilation, Annihilation Wave, that's a rogues gallery in and of itself, because you have basically every cosmic Marvel thing that somehow crosses over into that. Um, yeah, so those are my two. I want to say something on Daredevil's rogues gallery. I always thought he had a very extensive rogues gallery that could be right up there with Batman and Spider-Man. I think you just need some good writing, because I feel like, I always said that like, Daredevil has like, he has really great villains that or got their mark like with Frank Miller, like with Electra, Daredevil, and Kingpin. But he also and Bullseye. Has, and Bullseye. But he's also got um he's also got um he's also got characters like the Owl, Stilt Man, uh Purple Man, like all these unknown characters that I feel like if they got the same treatment that Bruce Tim did for Batman the Animated Series with all those villains, like he did with Mr. Freeze or Baby Doll or Clock King. Like all these unknown villains, if they got that kind of treatment, just like treated as like genuine characters instead of jokes with gimmicks, they could be extensive, memorable characters at a Rose Gallery. And Daredevils could get soared to Batman heights. So you're saying you want a Stiltman origin film? Well, no, <laughs> but I'm just saying Stiltman. I mean, Stiltman has like like cybernetic limbs that can elongate. He's basically elongate, man. I feel like there's something dangerous you can do with then I feel like if he was like rewritten to be like a cyborg or something with a tragic bad story, he could be actually a better villain. Well, remember if, if, if the, uh, the Netflix series are canon, which it seems like they are now because they're doing a daredevil born again show uh, on Disney plus, that means stilt man does exist in canon because if you look in the background, the stilt man legs are there. So the stilt man the does exist. Did, uh, daredevil's outfit, right? Yeah, the who's also a character called Gladiator, who I never even knew was a, a character before. I didn't know anything about him. John, do you know Gladiator? Yeah, um, he shoots. Um, well, he has saw uh, bands on his arms. Right, but um, that doesn't was, seem like a superpower. That just seems dangerous. Yeah. He was he was kind of a two bit thing until uh, the Frank Miller run, and um, 
you find out how obsessed he is with uh, Roman, ancient Roman culture and, and the gladiator uh, ethos. And, and struggle to be a good person. And uh, it was very compelling. But, but again, that's kind of one of those, like you said, one of those villains that, uh, that's little known, but uh, when written right, uh, can be extraordinary. Well, I mean, Alex, to your point, I think the uh, spirit of foes of Spider-Man is like, you know, it takes a bunch of absolutely, you know, D-list at best villains and makes them very compelling. So you can definitely, I mean, any character written well can be a good character. So I'm going to mention a couple villains that first appear in Daredevil that uh, end up being in other people's rogues gallery. Uh, Silver Samurai, who is usually a Wolverine villain, first appeared in Daredevil. And uh, I think this is his name just Nuke, the guy with the American yeah. flag in his face. Who is was in uh, uh, Jessica Banana. Jones <clears throat> season one? I, I don't know, but he's often a Captain America villain or uh, sometimes he's a Wolverine villain as well. It's kind of a, a failed Captain America. And in that case. But Jim, in the end, aren't we all failed Captain Americas? Yes. Even Captain America. All right. Does anybody have any final thoughts on rogues or galleries of any kind? Um, I just want to say, mention one last thing that kind of goes in terms of Daredevil, so it's gallery. Um, so one thing I've noticed with the Marvel, the, the one thing the Marvel Universe does great, the cinematic universe, is that they take these, let these villains who in comics seem like really underpowered foes that would be no threat against the hero. Like you, So you got like Vulture or uh, Mysterio, like you even have like uh, Arnim Zola, like all these minor, minor characters that don't really stand out to you, but they're able to p- depict them in a way that not only are they like a sympathetic, like a round, well rounded, well written, but they're also dangerous. I mean, how how they were able to do Vulture's technology in the first Spider Man movie was amazing, and then how they were able to incorporate Mysterio in this elaborate mystery with like all this Stark tech was incredible. And like, I mean, it, from a comic book standpoint, it looks like that wouldn't be a threat, but when you, when you place them in a real life setting, these guys can actually be a dangerous threat. Like as you see on Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or a Marvel show like Daredevil or uh, Luke Cage or Jessica Jones. It's just like these, unfor- these forgettable villains suddenly become unforgettable. Well, I think, uh, and this is not a character who doesn't have power, but I think it, what goes to, it goes to your point, um, the idea of the way a character is played is important. So when I watch The Boys, which is a show that I generally pretty much like quite a bit, um, Anthony Starr is what makes Homelander scary. His powers don't make him scary. His powers alone don't make him scary. But home, but but Anthony Starr playing that character as unstable and narcissistic and uh, insecure, that makes the character scary. Because it makes you unsure that that he doesn't even really know what he's doing at any particular time, and sort of so, you know, the way the characters played is what what's scary, and so so I definitely agree with that. Um, uh, Jim, do you have anything you got going on you'd like to tell people about? Uh, I do not. Uh, I'm planning on going to uh, I guess I do something. I'm planning on going to a convention in Kansas City this weekend. Um, just encourage it- everybody. To- is it planet or it is not planet uh i honestly don't even remember what it's called fountain city fountain city is kansas city uh, fountain city is that a thing it's it's in uh the (laughs) kansas side okay um i guess just encourage everybody there's a it seems like post covid shows are finally kind of back to the pre-covid levels and there's little shows going on all over the place just be careful because like a million people caught COVID at sdcc <clears throat> uh, alex do you have anything coming out you'd like to t- tell people about yes i'd like to kind of take this opportunity to promote energy comics my publishing company that's publishing titles such as zener and empress which are now in production like the first and we all to take this opportunity to promote our patreon we get first exclusive access to all our comic pages as they're completed right now we've started uh promoting we uh, publishing issue two of Zener online. We're promote we're publishing issue one of Empress online. Uh, in the fall, we're going to be done production production on Tune Man, uh, my passion project which I'm writing, 
and a big score. If we get to 20 followers on Patreon, like 20 pay, new patrons, we patrons, I can't talk. <laughs> in production and our on our first ever super team uh, superhero book, uh, Marauder Roadway Pirates, which is One Piece meets um, kind of like uh, Justice League. And it says it's about a crew of superhuman pirates that travel the world and protect the world just as much as they plunder it. So it has a real like milestone blood syndicate team book uh, enhancement to it, which I think everyone's going to love. If you love One Piece, Piece, and he loves superhero teams. You're gonna love this book. So follow us on inter- on Patreon, Twitter, Facebook, DeviantArt, uh, Instagram, YouTube. You'll find Energy Comics there just by finding Energy Comics. And we will have all that stuff. I can't down here. Yep. Yeah. Not on Jim's head, like below Jim's head. Yeah. Um, uh, John, what's going on with IO Comic Book Club? Well, um, we have a meeting coming up uh, the third Sunday of august at the urbandale library starting at one o'clock till four or, or however long it lasts um the, our big news is november 12th is the uh mini icon um which we're we're featuring uh two headlining artists one is phil he- phil hester John phil's phil. a, a native art uh, a native iowan excuse me um a lot of his, some of his credits include Swamp Thing, Brave New World, Flinch, Ultimate Marvel yeah, Team no. Up, Clerks, um, and a lot of his uh, own original stuff. Also, uh, Rich Kozlowski, um, he is a comic book and graphic novelist. Uh, some of his most popular works are The Three Geeks, as well as Three Fingers, The King, B.B. Wolf, and the three LPs, um, he's coming in from Wisconsin, and uh, we're really happy to, that that he's wanting to be here. And um, I've already gotten a lot of uh, uh, excitement with regards to uh, fans of uh, Three Fingers and the King. So, um, there's... and what's what's the book that he's um, kind of first promoting at our show? Because he has a graphic novel that's coming out. Do you remember the name of it? I think oh. it's that week that it's coming out. No, I I don't. Oh, I it's We'll put it we'll put it in the link below. Right, it's with uh Top Shelf. Um I, I, and I would like to uh, say that Phil Hester not only can he write and draw, but he can put up with me on Twitter, which means he's basically a saint. <laughs> um it's true, yeah. we can. Phil's great. Phil's great. And he's very active on Twitter and he's a lot of fun. Um, as far as me, uh, just doing cocktail channels and some discussion videos over on Intoxicated Masculinity. Uh, just came out with, I believe we're doing the Jungle Bird. Uh, we just came out with Jungle Bird now, as you're seeing this, probably came out with Jungle Bird last Wednesday. Um, last week, we had a discussion uh, with some people on ranking the Star Trek, first uh, six Star Trek movies. Uh, and as you're seeing this, we probably will next week be coming out with a video uh, talking with Josh uh, from Movie Timelines and Mark from Creative Psychopaths, com- comparing and contrasting uh, between A24 horror movies and Blumhouse horror movies. So if you like to be scared or watch people get their arms ripped off, um, then either watch our show or talk to a therapist. Um, <laughs> uh, just a reminder that we'll meet again it, uh, um, in one month in August. And uh, our topics w- is going to be our guilty pleasures. Uh, with uh, uh, our safe for work guilty pleasures. Yes. Uh, uh, for example, a, a hero or a series that um, that's under loved. Um, so top three, top five, um, if, if you have those. Does that have to be a comic or can it be like a movie or something? It could be a movie or anything. All right. I want to thank everybody for watching. Please like, share, and subscribe, and we will see you next month.